There is a darkness in humanity that has manifested itself in a lust for blood throughout the ages. The Old Testament and ancient myths catalog murder and revenge as part of the fabric of life in ancient times. Cain slew Abel. Romulus slew Remus. Unleashing the beast within is a possibility for all of us. The decision to kill from passion or premeditation has often defined our world, past, present, and future. Wars have terrorized entire populations for thousands of years. The American West was home to ruthless killers who were idolized in fiction and folklore. Evil evolved to a hideous new form with the genocidal dictators of the 20th century such as Hitler, Stalin, and Mao Zedong, who ordered the death of tens of millions. But in the middle of the 20th century, a new and chilling phenomenon emerged in post-war Western society, the serial killer. As if fashioned from our nightmares, they terrify and fascinate us. Lurking behind masks of bland normality, they often evade capture for years, decades, or eternity. They are America's serial killers. We killed her. We dumped her body off, and that was it. Nothing to it. Every year in this country, we have about 20 serial killers, 10 of whom are apprehended, 10 of whom are on the loose. And they are, in total, responsible for some 200 deaths. So 200 victims of serial killers on a yearly basis. And what makes this particularly important for us is that the average serial killer is responsible for 10 deaths. That's a huge body count. America's serial killers, portraits in evil, will strip the covers from a world of profiling and forensic science as we expose America's most brutal serial killers. It was October 2002, and for the first time ever, Washington, D.C. was experiencing a new kind of terror, a terror that struck from a distance. People riding in their cars along the many miles of freeway surrounding the nation's capital carried with them the fear that they could be next. The next victim, if they stopped to shop, stopped to fill their gas tanks, shot dead in an instant, shot dead from a distance. America had never experienced such a fear from the random acts of an unknown pair of serial killers. You know, th there's a certain irony here Statistically, there's a relatively small risk that any of us will be victimized by a serial killer. I don't mean to minimize the horror. Of course, there's that possibility. But statistically, it's a pretty small risk. And yet, it's that kind of crime that attracts intense interest. These are the headline kinds of crimes. I mean, all of us, sadly, have become almost immune to the story in our newspapers and the TV news about somebody who walks into a convenience store with a handgun, or somebody who robs a bank, or somebody who lights a fire and burns down an apartment building. I mean, these are horrible crimes, 
but they don't shock the conscience. We're so used to them. But when we hear about a sniper who kills 12 people, when we hear about somebody who moves from community to community, calculating who to kill next, which prostitute to get, these crimes shock the conscience because they are so out of the ordinary. They are so different from what, sadly, we've become quite used to. The more ordinary rape, the more ordinary assault, the more ordinary robbery, the more ordinary kidnapping. There are these crimes that just shock the conscience. And so I fully understand why the public is preoccupied with them. I think they are so outside the box that we have this understandable need to try to grasp. Why would somebody do that? That's human nature. Why would somebody take a rifle, sit behind a barricade and wait for innocent victims? Why would somebody do that? Why would somebody look for vulnerable children, kidnap them, torture them sexually, and kill them? It's hard for us to wrap our minds around these kinds of crimes. And it makes complete sense to me that the average human being would be both fascinated by this, horrified by this, mystified by this, and preoccupied by this. By the mid-70s, the phenomenon of serial killing was no longer a city or regional issue. The whole country was aware of these fiends who loved to kill. These brutal monsters who lived to see others die. Some, like the Zodiac Killer, taunted the police sent messages to newspapers in order to terrorize the cities where they lived. Some, such as Ted Bundy, were sexual sadists, predators who combined sex and violence for pleasure. Others, like the Son of Sam, killed for the joy of killing. But why in the United States? What gave America, the world's greatest democracy, the world's wealthiest country, the cruel irony of being the world's leader in serial killing? The serial killer phenomenon, I think, has really become synonymous with this country. A lot of people think there are more here because we have basically lost our sense of community. We don't know our neighbors. We don't have good feeling for our neighborhood. Um, we've lost a sense of in a, in a neighborhood where you're, you know, in the early days and you were farming, you would wave at people who went by. I don't see people waving at me in my neighborhood. Uh, and I think the other issue is the fact that we move so often. People change jobs to different locations for different jobs. And as we move, we lose our roots. And because we lose those roots, we don't uh, develop the sense of community. Uh, I, I think the evolution of large urban complex societies can sometimes provide the incubator for murder in the sense that we often know less about each other. There's more anonymity. And people who murder can sometimes go undetected because there isn't that kind of small town quality where everybody knows everyone else. There's more camouflage, there's more anonymity. The conventional answer was to blame it on the country's growth. America was becoming a very mobile, high-tech society, rapidly moving beyond its agrarian roots. Roots that had once maintained close social and family bonds. A society where serial killing was almost impossible because there was no easy prey on the fringes of the community. But that changed with urbanization. 
By the 70s, most Americans lived in large, overpopulated cities. But the answers to why America in the 70s and beyond produced so many serial killers wasn't simply that we now lived in large cities. Many criminologists saw that serial killers had entered the American consciousness through newscasts and newspapers. But the electronic media had then gone farther. The media had taken the sex and violence and turned it into drama. Almost overnight, the idea of serial killing had become a part of our fantasies. You also can't deny the role of the media. Now, I'm not a big, you know, I'm not a big believer in, you know, hey, you watch a serial killer crime on TV, you go commit one. I don't necessarily believe there's a causal relationship there. Maybe in some cases, maybe. But more than that, I think what it does is it distributes the notion. You know, maybe you're a mixed up person with a lot of hatred and a lot of negative feelings and you've been casting about and expressing it a lot of different ways. But then you watch a crime drama where somebody commits some sort of act and you yourself derive some satisfaction out of vicariously experiencing the act they committed. Maybe that makes you more likely to go and try and commit the act. Um, perhaps by reading about serial murder, by seeing it on TV, you develop um, a fantasy that, you know, let's face it, I think the, the centerpiece of a lot of this crime is fantasy fulfillment. Okay? You think about it, you think about it, you think about it, you think about it, you live it, you live it, you live it, and suddenly the thing that was purely imagination, you desire to see that fleshed out in, in reality. Once serial killing became known, once it saturated the American family and home, the fantasy became a reality for some people. Sometimes this steady drip, drip, drip exposure to violence in movies and television may increase the likelihood because there's this sense of familiar. And when things are familiar, sometimes we imitate, sometimes we're influenced by that. But if one has seen this kind of footage for years and years and years, there may not be anybody out there saying, go kill the person you don't like. But in that person's psyche, in their bones, there's this familiarity. I think that's it. I think there's a familiarity with violence in this culture that implicitly may send a signal to somebody with violent instincts. You have permission to kill. So anonymity within the type of society America had become was no longer an adequate explanation. Serial killing was too well known. It had achieved its own notoriety, its own celebrity. I mean, there was recently a case in California where a young kid killed his classmate and probably would have gone on to kill others. And his motive was he wanted to become a serial killer. I think he was only 10 or 11 years old. You know, so this is getting to our youth as well as, as well as older people. And it's not a very good message to get out there. They're glorifying uh, a very serious and in many cases, it's a very, very uh, gory, if you will, crime. Americans had come to accept serial killing as a reality and in a morbid way, looked forward to the next sensational case. And they got it with the buddy killers. A new psychological twist to these demented murderers. It is easier to work out the MO and signature of a lone serial killer, how he works. He is alone a despicable murderer who wants to be in control of his victims. However, a pair working together introduces 
a much more complex psychology, derived from the relationship to each other as well as to their victims. Even so, it is a complexity that mirrors the same need for control and dominance over their victims. With those type of situations, you have somebody usually that's dominant and somebody that's a little bit more submissive in the pairing, and the one that's dominant decides what they're gonna do and who they're gonna do and all that, and the submissive one basically does whatever the dominant one tells him to do. California is a large slice of paradise with a little something for everyone. Tall redwoods, snow-covered peaks, sandy beaches, and a highway system that connects all of it. The dark side of this paradise is that its freeway and street system provides the perfect mobility for sadistic buddy killers to find victims. Two of the most evil and prolific buddy killers to use this road system to their advantage were Angelo Buono and Kenneth Bianchi, AKA the Hillside Stranglers. They were cousins and fit the first of criminologist Dr. Jack Levin's reasons for how killing teams come together. When people think of serial killers, they think of loners. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth there. Lots of them have relationships with, with a spouse or a partner. Uh, they, they live with their, their wives and children. Uh, they, many of them hold a full-time job, uh, have lots of friends. Um, but about 25 to 30 percent of all serial killers actually murder in teams. Uh, they kill with a partner, with a, a, a cousin, a good friend, a lover. They kill together because there's some kind of chemistry uh, that they don't have when, there's, when they're alone. Kenneth Bianchi was born in 1951 in Connecticut to an alcoholic mother. After dropping out of college, he became a security guard and supported himself with petty thefts of the businesses and homes he was supposed to protect. He drifted to stay out of the clutches of the law and only settled down in 1977 when he finally arrived in Los Angeles and began hanging out with his cousin, Angelo Buono. Buono was older by 17 years. In trouble with the law from an early age, he was now a pimp. Wore fancy clothes, jewelry, and impressed Bianchi with tales of getting as many women as he wanted and, quote, putting them in their place, close quote. Bianchi joined his cousin as a pimp. Very quickly, the pair turned to murder. The older Buono was the mastermind. There's a number of cases of a serial murder that involve more than one individual who participated. Um, and the Hillside Stranglers are a classic example of two men whose aberrations uh, dovetailed nicely and allowed them to pursue their common interest uh, in killing and, well, in raping and killing these women. Um, one was a dominant character. I think that's, again, pretty typical of these pairings of serial killers. Um, uh, you know, Buono was a dominant personality. Um, he was the one who really gave the orders. He was the one who really, um, you know, he was the one who said, this is the night or this isn't the night, this is the time, this isn't the time. Posing as police officers from 1977 to 1978, the pair targeted Los Angeles, easily hunting down victims. Indeed, the Hillside Stranglers' M.O. had become a staple of television, replayed in shows such as Numbers and the CSI franchise. They used this M.O. to target women. 
Their first, on October 18th, was a Hollywood prostitute known as Yolanda Washington. They killed roughly once a week after that, dumping their victims' lifeless bodies on hillsides around Los Angeles, hence the name, the Hillside Stranglers. Their last victim, 20-year-old Cindy Hudspeth, was found February 16, 1978, in the trunk of her orange Datsun, driven off a cliff. Eerily, one night their trail of death took a macabre twist. Dressed in their trademark MO as police officers, they approached a young woman and asked for her ID. Her driver's license read Catherine Laurie, and next to it was a picture of her as a child sitting on the knee of actor Peter Laurie, her father. Ironically, Laurie had starred as the serial killer of children in the riveting movie M. The pair, not wanting to draw attention to themselves, left the daughter alone and moved on to another target. In addition to the hillside strangler's signature of death by strangulation using a ligature, the two men tortured their victims, making them the most depraved of all the buddy serial killers. They committed some really heinous acts like uh, in injecting people with uh, uh, boric acid, doing transfusions on people and then trying to stuff all kinds of cleaning chemicals besides boric acid into their system, uh, putting a bag over their head and uh, putting a vacuum cleaner on the bag, basically suffocating the victim. I mean, these are pretty horrific ways for people to die. So they came up with some doozies. In four months, they killed at least 10 women and perhaps scores more. But no one in law enforcement could figure out who they were or where they would strike next. The killers were too mobile, and Buono, the mastermind, was too smart. Then it all changed. Angelo Buono gave up killing, and bizarrely, this would lead to his capture and the undoing of their perverted buddy system. Without his cousin's leadership, Bianchi was lost. Bianchi, on the other hand, left LA and goes up to the state of Washington and works as a security guard, winds up killing two people and leaves a very, you know, it, the whole killing was very amateurish and he was discovered very rapidly. He had access to the home, where the victims had obviously been killed, even though they'd been stuffed in a car and dropped in a ravine later. You know, they got information on him, they had witnesses. So he was easily caught. Sentenced to death in the state of Washington, Bianchi turned on his cousin in order to save his own life. Buono was tried in California and found guilty. The presiding judge Ronald M. George declared at the end of the trial that he would have imposed the death penalty without a second thought for Buono's heinous acts if the jury had allowed it. Buono got life in prison. And Calipatria State Prison is where he died of a heart attack in 2002. Bianchi is currently serving a life sentence at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. Criminologist Jack Levin has met with Kenneth Bianchi. Their interaction was a startling glimpse into the mind of a serial killer. I interviewed Ken Bianchi, one of the Hillside Stranglers, a man who had killed 12 women and girls uh, in Los Angeles and also Bellingham, Washington. Um, and uh, when we met, he shook my hand in an appropriate way, you'd think, 
but he gripped it so tightly that I really thought I was going to scream. And I was thinking about that, that very hard handshake. And I was thinking, look, there are lots of people in this world who have a very hard handshake and they're very nice people. But knowing that Ken Miyake had killed 12 women, knowing how much he craved power and control suggested to me that that grip that he had on my hand was meant to send me a message. Look, pal, you may have your PhD and all that, but as long as you're here with me behind bars, I'm still in charge of things, and don't you forget it. The cousins were out of action, but California wasn't out of danger. Indeed, the state was rapidly becoming murder central in the perverted world of buddy serial killers. In Northern California, a pair of survivalists, Leonard Lake and Charles Ng, had built a chamber of horrors for raping, torturing, and killing their victims. All of it caught on videotape. Lake, abandoned by his mother when a child, turned his anger into a pathological hatred of women. Ng, on the other hand, was an ex-Marine who desperately sought a father figure. He easily fell in with Lake and his absurd plan to build a compound of underground bunkers to house women as sex slaves for the aftermath of World War III. In all, the perverted buddies killed as many as 12 women and men, raping the women and using the IDs and credit cards of the men to get money. They were brought to justice in 1985. While Northern California housed the torture bunker of one of the most demented of the serial killer pairs, it was once again LA that would draw attention to a new twist to this already twisted serial killing buddy system. This time, a woman and her lover traveled LA's streets and highways to kill. Ironically, there are more female serial killers than most people think. Uh, they frequently team up with a male serial killer. They're not always on their own. Carol Bundy, a nurse and divorced mother of two, found her killing mate in Doug Clark, a boiler engineer for the Jurgens Lotion Company. Together, they teamed up as the Sunset Strip Killers. As crazed a duo of serial killers that ever stalked the streets of America's cities. Starting in the spring of 1980, Bundy and Clark went on a murderous rampage through the City of Angels, a rampage that would leave six dead. The first victims were discovered in June. Two women, both killed with the same signature. A gunshot to the head. A gun purchased by Carol Bundy. This was followed by the tragic murder of Exie Wilson. Her head, chopped from her body, was discovered days later in an ornate wooden box. Quickly, the bodies began to stack up, each killed by a bullet to the head. Five women in all, prostitutes and teenage runaways, women from the fringes of society, the easiest victims. I think that the, the subject of the victims of these serial murders is probably something that is criminally under-discussed. Um, these are living, breathing human people whose lives were stolen from them by these, by these individuals. 
I think the fact that um, a lot of um, the victims of serial murderers were people from the fringes of society had a lot to do with not only their availability to the killer, but also to the lack of quick and decisive public response to their crimes. Um, when prostitutes start to disappear from the street, um, you know, prostitutes disappear all the time. You know, they, 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 they come and go, it's, it's, it's a transitory thing. Um, uh, you know, bums, hobos, you know, the old fashioned term, transients, homeless people, um, are easy targets for people who desire to commit these kinds of crimes. And the access to them is greater, the ability to get control of them is greater, and over time, depending on the killer's own pathology, um, the, 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 the notion of them being missing is significantly lessened. Um, you know, you look at, at people, at serial killers who did not kill um, um, prostitutes or people on the fringes of society. Those cases got a lot of attention and very quickly. The case was finally solved when police nabbed Carol Bundy for the murder of Jack Murray, a one-time lover who she shot, stabbed, and beheaded in the back of his van. Confronted with the evidence of her guilt, Bundy implicated her partner, Clark, and Clark returned the favor. The lovers turned on each other like the animals they were. Doug Clark, the Sunset Strip killer, is on death row in Los Angeles. He claims that it was his partner, Carol Bundy, who had killed nine people. Uh, maybe she did, maybe she didn't. We'll never know because she's no longer alive, so she's not going to confess. But Doug Clark can make a case, if you listen to him, uh, plenty of people believe it. Carol Bundy, a truly despicable serial killer, died in prison of heart failure in 2003. The decade of the 70s proved that the highways and byways of California, in fact, those of the entire nation, provided ample opportunity for couples cruising and killing. Two of the worst buddy serial killers were Gerald and Charlene Gallego. Born in 1946, Gerald was bad from birth, and by the time he was six, he already had a list of sex offenses. In 1977, he met Charlene Adele Williams, and a year later, they began their tour of killing. From September 1978, to November 1980, Gerald, with his wife Charlene's help, cruised the Southwest's highways, picking up victims. Before police brought them to justice, Gerald raped and killed nine women and shot one man while Charlene drove their van. Twenty years after this whirlwind of death, on the opposite side of the country, two men with a sniper rifle turned Washington, D.C. into their own gruesome human shooting gallery. Dubbed the Beltway Snipers by the press, John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo would hold the nation's capital hostage for 23 days. They formed the classic older man and younger man serial killing team. Born John Allen Williams, Muhammad had joined the Black Nation of Islam and in October 2001, at the age of 40, changed his name to John Allen Muhammad. Muhammad found Malvo at a homeless shelter and took the young teen to his house. He had lost his own children 
in a custody battle and now had a surrogate son, someone he could father, someone he could mentor. Only this mentoring was about depraved indifference to human life. In fact, it was their great distance from their victims that would add a new twist to the usual serial murder team. The Beltway killings were completely different, whether you want to believe they're politically motivated, whether they're religiously motivated, um, and they had planned to just start targeting people and just start killing them. Um, and it wasn't for the personal contact or the personal control over somebody like you see with so many of these people. It was reaching out from a distance, reaching out literally and touching someone where they were shooting them from a distance and killing them. They don't even see their work close up. So that's a little bit different breed of animal. Muhammad and Malvo's trek of death began in Tacoma, Washington, where, according to the Seattle Times newspaper, they practiced their sniper skills on the firing range of a gun store known as Bullseye Shooter Supply. Their first kill came in Montgomery, Alabama, when Claudine Parker was shot in a liquor store holdup. Their serial killing began in earnest on October 2nd, when, in the span of 20 hours, Muhammad and Malvo shot six people in Montgomery County, Maryland. All were killed with what would become the Beltway Sniper's trademark MO and signature, lying in wait and killing their victims at a distance with a single round from a Bushmaster XM-15, the perfect sniper rifle. What I think is interesting, again, with the Beltway Snipers, and it was in the area around Washington, um, Again, you have a pair of individuals, one person more dominant than the other, um, but uh, you have um, a desire for a kind of anonymous crime. The uh, victims and the, the killers were not, not only were they not connected in any you know, specific way that they knew each other, but they were disconnected by a great deal of, of physical space. Uh, by, by killing them from a distance, um, you know, you not only removed a lot of the danger of apprehension, but you also removed any close, up close and personal connection to the victim. Muhammad and Malvo were cowards who staked out places where people shopped, gas stations, convenience stores, on streets where they walked. The only purpose was to terrorize create a panic. Their tactic worked. Fear shot through the communities of Montgomery County and throughout the nation's capital. Schools went into lockdown. Muhammad and Malvo widened their range, and the real plan behind their killings began to unfold. On October 7th, after Iran Brown, a 13-year-old schoolboy, was wounded as he arrived at school, police found a tarot card with the note, Dear Policeman, I am God. Over the next 15 days, with another five people shot and killed, their plan became clear in long, rambling messages to the police a ransom demand of $10 million to free the nation's capital from the terror of the Beltway Snipers. The Beltway Snipers uh, began uh, with a profit motive. Uh, they uh, had decided to extort $10 million uh, from the authorities. Uh, first, they killed five people at random in the D.C. area in October 2002, and then they intended to stop and negotiate with Chief Moose uh, for the money. Uh, so Malvo, the younger of the two killers, uh, called the tip hotline. Unfortunately, the operator had received 70,000 tips 
unmanageable, unable to place in any priority level because of the vast number. And so hung up four times on Malvo, who got very frustrated by his inability to get through and instead killed more people. Rather than attempting to make money, they instead liked becoming celebrities. Uh, you know, they enjoyed uh, uh, playing a cat and mouse game with the police and taunting them in some of their messages. I am God, meaning you'll never catch me. I'm superior to you. But they weren't gods, and their tirade of terror would not last much longer. The police now knew the make and model of the car, a blue Chevy Caprice. On October 24th, they found John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo sleeping in their car. At last, the nightmare was over. At trial, prosecutors introduced exhibits showing that Muhammad and Malvo planned to emulate the Islamic jihadists and terrorists of 9-11. One was a portrait of Saddam Hussein labeled as a protector. Another was a father and son portrait of Malvo and Muhammad with the words, we will kill them all, jihad. There are these cases where you find two perpetrators working together. There's a psychiatric term for this that sometimes fits. It's French, folie aux deux, the folly of two, the craziness of two. And what I've found is that in some instances, you find this kind of circle the wagons mentality where you have a very influential offender and a very impressionable offender the latter taken under the tutelage of the former, for example. Um, often somebody who's very needy, who wants or needs a father figure. And you find these two individuals who view the world from the perspective of their own little bubble. And they seem to have convinced each other that they need to kill, that they want people to suffer and they feed each other's twisted perception and rationalize the murders. It's almost as if they are enveloped in this twisted worldview where their wish to kill, their need to kill, is insulated from the more common sense understandings that the rest of us have about why that would be so horrible. At trial, Lee Boyd Malvo testified that the motive for their murders was political. Muhammad was going to use the $10 million to train an army of homeless young boys who would then spread out through the nation, terrorizing its cities and sending America into panic and chaos a distorted worldview common to cults and among pairs of serial killers. Everybody's familiar with cults, cult phenomena. We're used to thinking of cults as large groups of people who share a religious belief or a political belief. Well, in my mind, sometimes when you find pairs of killers, it's almost like a cult phenomenon where there's this narrow view of how the world works that's limited to this pair, these two people. It's very cult-like, but it's in the form of two people, not a large group of people. The psychology, in some ways, I think is very similar. As for John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo, Many states wanted them to stand trial, but Virginia and Maryland got the honors. In the fall of 2003, Muhammad and Malvo were each found guilty of murder in Virginia. 
only Muhammad got the death penalty, having gained, for a moment, celebrity status. And the celebrity function was carried out simply because their images were on the cover of all of our news and celebrity magazines around the country. They became big shots. They were the, the national anti-heroes that they had hoped to become. In the 21st century, there are more serial killers operating than ever. But with the saturation of crime dramas depicting these murderers, it seems impossible to draw the large media attention they once had. Indeed, Americans inured to the horrific acts of Jeffrey Dahmer and the impersonal sniper attacks of Muhammad and Malvo have become desensitized to what had once been sensational crimes.